One of the questions that I have asked myself is if I were alive when Jesus was here on this earth, would I have followed him? Have you ever asked us that question? If I were alive when Jesus was walking on the earth and I lived in Israel, would I have followed him? Would his miracles have convinced me that he was the Messiah? Would his teachings have convinced me he was the Messiah? How he dealt with the sick and the prostitutes and the beggars and the tax collectors, would that have convinced me he was the Messiah? And if maybe so, how firm would I have been in my belief? Would I have continued to follow Jesus after that time when he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood? The Bible says at that point, many of his disciples no longer walked with him. Would I have been one of those people? Would I have turned away from Jesus because of the rumors? You know, when Jesus was here, there were rumors. People said he was an illegitimate child. People said that he had demons in him. People said that he operated under the power of Satan. Would I have believed those rumors? Would they have kept me from following Jesus? And if not, if I would not have believed those rumors, why not? Would I have truly believed that Jesus was the Son of God? The Son of Man? Now, those are questions I ask myself. Maybe you have. Would I have followed Jesus when he was on this earth? And one of the questions that I think we have to grapple with is how do you determine truth from falsehood? We are living in an age of deception. It's always been deception. But because of social media, 24-hour news, I would argue it's greater than ever before. The deception that's in the world. And the Bible tells us in the last days, deception is going to grow more and more intense. And in fact, even the elect... Believers may actually be deceived. So how do we avoid being deceived? How do you tell truth from error? So I titled this Lessons from a Kangaroo Court. Now you may be, I, I don't know what that is. Well, let me give you a walkthrough. This is a kangaroo. Everybody know that's a kangaroo. All right, they live in Australia and they're mean. This is a courtroom. And this is a kangaroo court. A bunch of kangaroos in the courtroom. Now you say, I don't understand. Why do they call it a kangaroo court? If you've ever watched a kangaroo, they hop and jump. They don't walk. They just boing, boing, boing. They just hop. They jump. A kangaroo court is the idea that instead of walking through the evidence, slowly looking at the evidence, they just jump over the evidence because there is a predetermined conclusion that those who have called the court case already know what they want the verdict to be. And they're not really interested in the evidence. You'd say, well, Jim, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody bring somebody to trial? They're not really interested in the evidence. They already have a predetermined solution. Well, one of the reasons that kangaroo courts have happened is you have to realize that most people honestly just are not very involved in what's going on around them. And so uh, maybe the group that wants to come after a person, they'll call a court case together. And they know that the general public, when they see that, oh, so-and-so has been brought on trial, they'll immediately say, they must be guilty. Because why would you ever put anybody on trial unless they're guilty? And so people will do kangaroo courts because they know in the eyes of the public that will immediately taint the individual. It's a great tool for propaganda. Kangaroo courts are designed to silence the opposition. 
Because if the general public sees this person's been put on trial, they must be guilty. Why would you put them on trial? And so why should we ever follow this person? Kangaroo courts are designed to delegitimize the opposition. They're not a legitimate opposition. You're like, okay, I don't really know what that looks like. Well, take a look at your Bibles at Luke chapter 22. Turn your Bibles to Luke 22. And in Luke chapter 22, I'm just going to start. <coughs> there was a problem. The establishment, what I mean is the Jewish rulers, the religious leaders of the temple, they didn't like Jesus. Jesus was causing them problems. All right? These rulers had been in power for decades. The religious establishment, the temple, that whole institution, had been ruling for decades over the Jewish people as far as the religion of the land. And they had developed their own rules and their own systems. And they had their own players put in place. And then Jesus comes along and he totally messes it up. And they see Jesus as a threat. We don't want Jesus. He's going to mess things up. And large crowds of people are coming out to hear Jesus. And they don't like that. And there are people that are claiming to follow Jesus. And they don't like that. Jesus is a threat to the system. And so how in the world is the religious establishment going to stop Jesus? Because if you look at the beginning of Luke chapter 2, 22... It said the chief priests and scribes were looking for a way to put him to death because they were afraid of the people. They were afraid of the people. And they were afraid if they did something blatant, just arrested Jesus in public, they were going to be in big trouble. So they had to figure out a way to turn the public against Jesus. And so what better way to do that than to call a kangaroo court to put Jesus on trial. So the first thing they had to do was to find a traitor. Somebody on the inside. You all know his name, it was Judas. If they could find an insider, a disciple of Jesus to turn against Jesus, that would cause a lot of people in the public who just aren't really paying a lot of attention to say, there must be something wrong in Jesus' camp. Something must not be right, or his own people wouldn't turn against him. And so they get Judas. You know the story. Jesus goes out to pray like he always did in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was on the Mount of Olives. Judas knows that. Judas leads the soldiers to Jesus. Judas kisses him on the cheek to show that he is the one. They arrest Jesus now go down to verse 66. Jesus has been arrested. And it says, When daylight came, the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the scribes, convened and brought him before their Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a group of about 70 people made up of the Sadducees, which were the aristocrats, as well as the Pharisees, which were kind of the the, the middle class laity. And so there's about 70 people. And so they bring him before this ruling council because the decisions of the Sanhedrin dealt with the religious part of Israel. The Romans didn't want to have anything to do with the Jews and their religion. So they let the Sanhedrin deal with it. So the Sanhedrin is called early daylight hours. They bring Jesus there to put him on trial. Again, why would they put on Jesus on trial? Because they knew that a lot of people in the public who weren't really following things, which usually is the majority of the public, would say, wait a minute, did you hear they put Jesus on trial? The religious leaders? There must be something wrong with Jesus. He must have done something really bad. Hey, did you hear that one of his own betrayed him? He must be really bad. I don't know if we should follow this Jesus guy. 
And so this was designed to start getting people to doubt whether they could follow Jesus. Because after all, if he was a good guy, nobody would put him on trial, right? That's the point of the kangaroo court. So the trial begins. They said, if you are the Messiah, tell us. I found that interesting, just stopping right there. And I went through the book of Luke, and Jesus never called himself the Messiah. And they never called him the Messiah. And I wondered, why did they use the word Messiah? Folks, let me tell you something. One of the ways that you detect truth from error is you pay attention to words. I believe the reason they use the word Messiah is because the general public was looking for the Messiah. Jesus never called himself the Messiah. He always called himself the Son of Man, which goes back to the book of Daniel. But the general population just was looking for the Messiah, not the Son of Man, even though they're the same person. I think they phrased it this way because this is what the general public was looking for. And if Jesus said, yes, I am the Messiah, they would immediately accuse him of blasphemy. How can you be a man and be the Messiah? And, and, and so if, if Jesus said, yes, I'm the Messiah, then the people would have been confused. If Jesus said, I'm the Messiah, the people would have been like, wait a minute. How can the Messiah allow himself to be arrested? How can the Messiah allow himself to be put on trial? If he's the Messiah, why hasn't he liberated us from Rome? Because that's what they believe the Messiah would do. Why, why, why isn't he setting up his throne in Jerusalem? Because that's what the Old Testament said he would do. And so I think they ask it that way, are you the Messiah? Again, with the eye on the public, as the public's going to hear about this trial, and the public will say, well, he didn't say he was the Messiah. And, of course, if he had said, I'm the Messiah, the Sanhedrin could have said, you're blaspheming and stoned him to death. They could stone people to death. They couldn't crucify people. They didn't have that authority. But they could stone him to death for blasphemy. But here's the problem. The Sanhedrin did not want to stone Jesus to death because then they would look like the bad guys in the eyes of a lot of people. They didn't want to look like the bad guys. So they, they knew they were kind of a little bit in a rock and a hard place, so Jesus fires back with a question. He says, if I ask you, you will not answer. See, Jesus knows, hey, I'll, I'll play your game. What if I ask you, who do you think I am? But if I ask you, you're not going to answer because you don't want to be involved. You, what you want to do is have me crucified, but you want to wipe your hands of it. Hey, we had nothing to do with it. We were clean. It was all him. And so Jesus knows they're playing a game. He says, if I ask you, you would not answer. And, and, and it says, from now on, he says, you would not answer. In fact, Jesus said, Earlier, he said, if I do tell you, let's say if I said that I am the Messiah, you wouldn't believe it anyways. You know, one of the hardest things for me to have accepted is there are a lot of people that just simply will not believe the truth. You can tell them the truth about Jesus and they absolutely will not believe it. Not because there's no evidence. They refuse to believe. I mean, there's a lot of people today who argue there is no God. Say, well, then what created this? Two rocks? Where do you get emotion from a rock? Where do you get order and design from a rock? Where do you get motion from a rock? And you got PhDs, scientists, brainiacs, who absolutely refuse to believe there is a God. Not because there's no evidence. They don't want to believe the evidence. Because if there's a God, then I'm responsible. And I don't want to believe it. 
And so they'll jump through all sorts of hoops and have all these long, contorted, crazy arguments that makes it sound like they're smart, but they're just ignorant because they don't want to believe. The reality is they weren't trying to find the truth. This court, they weren't interested in the truth. They had already determined what they were going to do. And Jesus said, if I told you, you wouldn't have believed it anyways. And if I ask you, you're not going to answer. So then Jesus says this. But from now on, the Son of Man, which is how he referred to himself, because that's how the prophet Daniel referred to him, will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Now, this is a prophecy from now on. You know what Jesus is indicating? I know what you're going to do. You're going to crucify me. You're going to send me to the cross. This is all a sham. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when it's over. I'm going to be seated at the right hand of the Father, of God. And again, <clears throat> these were religious people, religious leaders. They knew where Jesus was pointing back to. And, and, and so he goes on, and they ask him, Are you then the Son of God? Okay, you just quoted from Daniel. So are you saying you're the Son of God? And Jesus said to them, You say that I am. Now, that's kind of a, like, what is he getting at? I think what Jesus is saying is this. You guys put me on trial. You put me on trial because you claim that I claim that I am the Son of God. And I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to deny who I am. I am the Son of God. All right, so we looked at this trial. So my question is, okay, what lessons do we learn from a kangaroo court? And the reason I want to share this this morning is as we live in the age of deception, as you watch the news, be very careful at what, listen carefully and watch carefully what's happening in the world. First of all, one lesson from a kangaroo court is facts simply do not matter. Or they're very choosy about the facts. See, I noticed that there were no witnesses brought forward to testify about Jesus' miracles. There were no witnesses that testified about the different kinds of miracles or the difficulties of Jesus' miracles or the scope of Jesus. There, there was none of that. I also noticed there was no witnesses brought forward to talk about Jesus casting out demons. In fact, some of these guys had seen it happen. Because they had accused Jesus of casting out demons using Satan. But they never brought that up. In fact, Jesus didn't just cast out a demon here or there. He cast out thousands at one time. They, they, they never brought up the evidence that Jesus was fulfilling prophecy. Nobody brought in Mary to learn about the virgin birth. They didn't talk about Jesus was born in Bethlehem and how he went to Egypt and fulfilled Bible prophecy. They didn't talk about his ministry in Galilee or his lineage, the tribe of Judah, the line of David. None of that mattered. They weren't interested in those facts. They had a predetermined verdict. None of the disciples were brought forward to be character witnesses. They had their betrayer Judas and they just left it at that. You see, facts don't really matter in a kangaroo court. It's not really the important thing. Or they're very choosy about what they want to bring forward. Again, remember the purpose of a kangaroo court is to sway the public in one direction. And so Jesus gives his statement. They stand up. Why do we need any more testimony, they said, since we have heard it ourselves from his mouth. And I'm like, what did they hear from Jesus' mouth? Question, are you the Messiah? You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Are you the Son of God? You've said that I am the Son of God. You're guilty. They already knew the verdict that they wanted. They weren't interested in what Jesus had to say. They already had the verdict. And by the way, notice Jesus didn't stop them. Jesus didn't say, no, I'm not the Son of God. He didn't say that. He didn't say, no, I'm not the Messiah, because he is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. 
And Jesus accepted their verdict. He didn't fight it because he knew it was true. He is the Son of God. On the other hand, their reaction shows you they had a predetermined verdict. They, they weren't interested in the truth. They just wanted to get Jesus killed. So look at verse chapter 23. <clears throat> so then their whole assembly rose up and brought him before Pilate. Pilate is the Roman uh, leader there. He's in Jerusalem. Normally didn't say in Jerusalem, but he's there for the Passover feast. That's when he would come because the idea was if there's going to be an uprising, it's probably going to be during the Passover. So he was in town for the Passover. All timing. They began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Now, wait a minute. That, that, half this stuff wasn't brought up in that trial. What, what are they doing here? You guys are, all of a sudden, we have additional charges. Misleading the nation, opposing payment of taxes to Caesar. What? What? Let me give you another lesson from a kangaroo court. Kangaroo courts like to use vague charges. A lot of times they're very conflated charges, and they're, they're charges that don't really normally wouldn't work, but they, they, they conflate things, and they put them together to hobble together accusations that simply aren't true. They said, you began to mislead our nation. We found this man misleading our nation. Misleading the nation to do what? They never told me. We just found you misleading our nation. Jesus could have turned around and said, I found you misleading the nation. They would have been guilty. They, they, it's a very vague charge. Misleading the nation to do what? And then here's the other one. Another kangaroo court. False accusations. Going back to that verse. We found this man opposing payment of taxes to Caesar. Do you all recall a time anywhere where Jesus said, don't pay your taxes? No. In fact, earlier in Luke chapter 20, if you remember the story, the chief priests, they sent out spies to question Jesus when Jesus was in the temple just a few days before the trial. And they asked him about taxes. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what Caesar and give to God what's God's. It happened right there in the temple just a few days before. It went from that to, hey, he doesn't want people to pay taxes. Now, why would they say that? Because now they wanted Rome to get involved. Now it, they're trying to do political charges against Jesus. But Jesus never said that. It was a false accusation. Okay? And then they, they come up. And they have misleading statements. This is another characteristic of kangaroo courts. There'll be misleading statements. For example, saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. If you read Luke, Luke never said, Jesus never said, I am the king. Jesus always preached about the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus was all about God's kingdom. They're trying to take that statement and paint it as if Jesus is saying, I am a political king. I am here to be an earthly king. He never said that. So they're taking what Jesus said about the kingdom of God and they're conflating it to come up with a new charge. It's a very misleading statement. Why are they doing that? They're trying to get Pilate upset here. They're trying to get Rome involved. So Pilate, he's not a dummy. He asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, you say so. It's kind of a same type of statement Jesus gave back when they asked him, are you the son of God? It's kind of that same thing, like, if you say I am. So Pilate goes on and he says, <clears throat> Pilate told the chief priests of the, the crowds, I find no grounds for charging him. Now, how was it that the Sanhedrin found him guilty and Pilate does not? Because the Sanhedrin had a predetermined verdict. Pilate didn't have a verdict. He didn't have anything predetermined. He's like, I don't find any evidence here. He's not guilty. 
All right, now we've got a problem. Because if Pilate doesn't find him guilty, then that means he won't be crucified. And that means the Sanhedrin either has to stone him to death, which makes them the bad guys, or they just have to let this thing go away. So what do you do when it's not going your way? Well, they kept insisting. Now they're getting emotional. He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, where he started, even to here. Now they're trying to stir the people up. And when Pilate heard this, he asked, is he a Galilean? In other words, is he from the northern part? Now, Gal the Pilate's looking for an out, okay? He doesn't want to get involved in this mess. So guess who rules in Galilee? Herod. So, finding that he was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod. Why don't you go talk to Herod? He's in town too. Who was also in Jerusalem during those days? Herod was very glad to see Jesus. For a long time, he had wanted to see him because he had heard about him and was hoping to see some miracle. Herod was like, perform for me, Jesus. Folks, Jesus is not an entertainer. He is nobody's entertainer. <clears throat> so Jesus, no, not playing that game. So they kept asking him questions, but Jesus didn't answer him. I'm not, I'm not playing your game, Herod. I'm not here to entertain you. The chief priests and the scribes, notice the emotions, stood by vehemently accusing him. And here's another lesson from a kangaroo court. When the verdict doesn't go the way the court wants it or whatever, or when it seems like they're losing the public, you always resort to excessive emotion, excessive emotional displays. So they're standing by and they're vehemently, no, you've got to believe it. He, he, is, he is misleading our people. He's telling people to pose payment. To and Herod's like, you guys, come on. And they're just like getting all worked up. <clears throat> and then Herod with his soldiers all right, do something, you know. He's a Jew, so let's whip him and have some fun. So they treated him with contempt, mocked him, dressed him in bright clothing, and sent him back to Pilate. Herod's like, if you're not going to entertain me, I'm going to have a little bit of fun out of this. And so he mocks Jesus. And it says that very day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Previously, they had been enemies. They have a common ground now. Jesus. We keep reading what happens. Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people. <clears throat> he said to them, You have brought me this man as one who misleads the people. But in fact, after examining him in your presence, I find no grounds to charge this man with these things you're accusing me of. Neither has Herod, because he sent him back to us. Clearly he has done nothing wrong. Okay, y'all are just blowing this thing way out. Therefore, I will have him whipped... I'll give you a little bit of satisfaction, and then I'm going to release them. Notice the emotions. But they cried out all together, Take this man away from us. Release Barabbas. You can't do this. If Barabbas had been thrown into prison for rebellion that had taken place in the city and for murders. This is not a good guy. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate addressed them again. Pilate's like, I really don't want to have anything to do with this. But they kept shouting. They're getting worked up into a frenzy. Crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, why? What has this man done wrong? I found him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have him whipped and release him. But they kept up the pressure, demanding with loud voices. And their voices won out. And Pilate decided to grant their demand and release the one they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for rebellion and murder, but he handed Jesus over to their will. So, kangaroo courts did not happen just in Jesus' day. They've happened all throughout history. And a lot of times they happen when somebody is threatening the establishment, the way things are. And so sometimes they will create a kangaroo court to, 
taint this person. And that's what was going on with Jesus. And it's very important because we know the Antichrist is coming. And the whole world will follow after him. And in fact, maybe even believers will be initially deceived. Jesus leaves open that possibility. So how do you avoid being deceived? Well, first of all, I want you to remember this, folks. There is a spiritual war going on with physical results. There is a spiritual war going on in this world. I've said that over and over again, but we always need to remember. It's not just what we see with our eyes. There are things going on around us. There's spiritual wickedness in high places. And Satan is a master at deception. And Satan manipulates and uses institutions, political, religious, academic, even medical, that can even lead people astray. So how do you deal with deception? I just want to give you a few thoughts today. Because every case is going to come along, and we're going to see more and more stuff happening in our country and around the world. And you can't just you take one and go to another, another. This one right here with Jesus gives us a good template. So how do you avoid being deceived? First of all, I want to tell you this. Pray for wisdom. When you hear things and see things, pray for wisdom. Not everybody bought into the kangaroo court. The women went all the way to the cross and the tomb with Jesus. They didn't buy into the kangaroo court. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were part of the Sanhedrin, apparently they didn't buy into the kangaroo court. There were other disciples, undoubtedly, who didn't believe the verdict. So just because everybody's going along with the verdict doesn't mean it's necessarily true. In our day of social media and 24-hour news, there's a lot of pressure to follow the masses, and it's going to get worse. I mean, in countries like China, and it may eventually come to here, and UK and Europe and all that, there is the social credit score. And if you don't drive a certain way and you don't behave a certain way, they take your credit points away and restrict whether you can fly and all those things. Could be coming to America. And we need to pray for wisdom. It's natural if you're a student in college or seminary to trust your professor with a PhD. But I've been around the block too long to know that just because somebody has a PhD doesn't necessarily mean they know the truth. And it's natural to trust politicians and government officials, but I've been around too long to see them lie out their, their mouth all the time. We need to make sure that we pray for wisdom. I'm not saying every politician is evil or every religious leader and every academic is. There are wonderful people. But there's a lot of manipulators too. So pray for wisdom so that you won't be duped. You and I need to have discernment in this day and age. <clears throat> the discernment is the ability to make a good judgment. It's the ability to look at the facts and say, are these true or are they not? And again, pray for wisdom. And let me say this, knowledge is not wisdom. Who doesn't have any degrees and be a very wise person. Wise people have knowledge, but I would argue it's not knowledge about just stuff, it's knowledge about God. Wise people spend their time learning about God. They spend their time in prayer. Wise people have a focus that's different. In fact, I would say that prayer is huge in discernment. Because when you're praying about, Lord, is this the right thing? And what I'm hearing, is this true? Is this not true? I personally believe if you take that to the Lord, the Holy Spirit will speak into your heart. And he will give you a, a check like something's not right here or a sense of peace. I also think 
praying through something gives you a chance to step back from your emotions. Gives you a chance to pause and to spend time with the Lord. Now, let me say, there's nothing wrong with emotions, but let me be honest with you. The best way to manipulate people is through fear. If you can get people afraid, you can make people do almost anything. And so you have to be careful. We as believers cannot allow fear to control us. We have to make sure that we are basing our decisions on the Word of God and on God's wisdom. And that comes through praying. It comes through reading the Scriptures. It comes through learning about God. Don't make a decision just based on fear. And don't make a decision just based on emotion. In fact, I would argue emotions should be secondary. Look at the facts. And I would tell you in this day and age, listen carefully to what's being said. I'm a wordsmith. I deal in words. At one point, I was a, a professional writer. I know that you can frame an argument in a way to give an impression that's not exactly true. Your choice of words and how you frame a headline or how you write an article can lean people in a direction that may not be the truth. Be very careful and listen to the words that are being said, how they're being said. Why did they use that word? Why did they use that phrase? And let me tell you, don't just blindly follow the masses. I'm going to use one example, and I, I really want to be careful with this, but I'm just going to give you an example. Politicians today are saying, democracy, America is a democracy. It's not. America is not a democracy. America is a constitutional republic. Read the Constitution. Read the Founding Fathers. My dad's very schooled in American history. He can tell you a lot more than I can. America is not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic, and there's a difference. A democracy is ran by the majority of the people. Our founding fathers purposely designed America not to be a democracy. You know why? Because democracies almost always descend into tyranny. Read your history. We were designed to be a constitutional republic to guard against tyranny. So when I hear politicians saying, we got to do our democracy, I'm like, why are you saying that? We're not a democracy. It sounds good, I get it, but we're not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic that, rep that, that, that votes and appoints representatives who represent us, the people. That's why we have things that, the way we have three branches of government. Our branches of government are designed to be separate from each other. You know why? Checks and balances. Do you know why we have three branches of government? You know why it's hard to get things passed in America? It's by design. The Founding Fathers designed it to be difficult so that things were carefully done. America is not a democracy. We have three branches of government. It's all by design. So when I hear certain buzz phrases, I'm like, but that's not really how we're set up. I get it, it plays well, and people are like, yeah! But it's like, you need to learn your history. Listen carefully. All I'm saying, I just wanted to use that as an example, practice discernment. And my question to you is, do you practice discernment? As these days, I believe, again, I believe we're near getting in maybe the last few decades. I don't know how long, but I don't think Jesus is too long delayed. We know deception is going to get greater and greater and greater. And we as believers need to listen carefully, pray for wisdom, look at the facts, and pray for discernment. 
be careful. Don't just get caught up in the emotion. Be discerning. Not everybody caught up, got caught up in the Sanhedrin. Some of them said, no, this isn't right. But the majority did. Be careful. That's all I want to say this morning. That's my warning. Practice discernment. When it comes to religious leaders, when it comes to politicians, when it comes to academic, just practice discernment. Let's pray. Father, <clears throat> I pray that we will just be a people who practice discernment. May we be on our knees in prayer. May we learn about you, who you are. May we be wise about the spiritual battles that are going on around us. May we not be just caught up in the emotions of the moment or the masses. May we listen carefully. May we be students of your word. And Father, we know that there is a great delusion that's coming. And Father, we see so many small delusions that are happening and so many deceptive things that are being thrown out there. And may we be, as Jesus said, wise as serpents. Harmless as doves, but wise as serpents. Give us the ability to see through what's going on. Help us, Lord, to make wise decisions as individuals, as a church. And may we not forget that our calling is the kingdom of God. That we are here, as much as we may love our country, we are here ultimately for the kingdom of God. To share the gospel, the good news. Because the only way this is all going to be turned around is by people coming to faith in Christ. And may we share the good news of the gospel. But at the same time, be wise. And so, Father, we just pray for wisdom today as we navigate through these murky waters. Father, help us to listen carefully, to keep our eyes always fixed on you, and to take everything to you in prayer. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.